Hi, I'm Kate from the Australia Institute and I'm here today to have a chat with Arnie Pat about The Voice. Sure. To start with, let's go back to the very start. Where did The Voice proposal come from? It came from us. It's really important for the viewers to understand it isn't a government initiative. It came from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, first peoples of this vast, beautiful land that we all share. This has been a long process. The consultations, regional dialogues we had around the country, they culminated in the issuing of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. So, Ani Pat, you were part of the 12 dialogues, and where have we gone from there? All of those 12 dialogues elected delegates to represent them after a three day meeting at the um, convention, uh, the Constitutional Convention. So, all of that process ended up with issuing of the Uluru Statement from the Heart as a gift, an invitation to the Australian people to walk with us for a better future for the country. So that's, but it's a long, even longer process. This mm -hmm. latest process is um, 14 or well, 12 years, but we started doing this a long time ago. Generations of us have been pretty much asking for the same thing. None of the ideas were new. In fact, William Cooper in the 1920s and 30s first talked about something that looks like a voice to the parliament of the day. So. Generation after generation, we've been jumping up and down and saying, we're here, this is our place, acknowledge and respect us. And that's what is on the table um, at the moment, a very simple ask to um, say yes at the referendum so that we can change the constitution, so we can have a protected voice, so we can talk to the parliament of the day as well as the executive on issues that affect us. So before a referendum was even on the table, this was an invitation to the Australian people rather than politicians or, or any parliament across Australia. Mm. Why, why the Australian people? Despite our bloody history, people at the dialogue recognised, I suppose, not I suppose, they said it very clearly, that the Australian public, they helped us in 1967 and will ask and will help them again because there was this strong belief that Australians were generally, were fundamentally rather, good people and they believed in their common decency. So um, it was a very conscious decision to gift the Uluru Statement, a gift of hope and love to the Australian people, asking them again um, to help us. We, we did that because we also, the people are also very aware that the power of voice enshrined in the Constitution it's for the people to decide. It's for you who decide what sort of a country we're going to be um, earlier. Not so much the politicians. They are elected by, by all of us. So the real power of what a nation looks like and who it is in the world rests with the people. Now our mob knew, knew that very clearly and wanted to engage not so much with politicians but with the Australian public. Because that belief in the, the common decency um, of you all. And so the referendum is up to the Australian people, but I suppose parliamentarians will have an important role to play. If the referendum does get up, they are going to have an important role to play in designing the voice as well with First Nations people, because yeah. there's a lot of questions around at the moment of exactly, you know, what will the voice look like? What size will it take? How will it work? But really that hasn't been decided yet, because as you said, it's a concept. It's not the final design, which has to go through our parliament again, doesn't it? We don't. This country has never taken a model um, to referenda. It's always been a principle. I mean, even the setting up the Federation itself and the High Court and what have you. They just put that idea to the people, the voters, at the time was mainly um, rich, uh, non-Indigenous men. Mm -hmm. No women were included. Of course, we definitely weren't included, but nor were women. <laughs> so it was a principle, and that's what we've done all along. It's just this this clamour for detail, we've never gone to referenda on a model. We have gone on an idea, a concept, a set of principles. This is a really good idea. We think it's a good idea. What do you guys reckon? And the nation says yes or no. This is the same. This is exactly the same. So, Ani Pat, what will the voice look like? There's a lot of questions around at the moment, but Parliament will play an important role in actually designing exactly what the final voice looks like, won't they? Parliament in concert with us because we've just gone to a successful referendum and got yes, and it says that we should be involved and consulted and engaged 
in all the decisions and policies that affect us. So we will definitely be at the table after, after a successful referendum. So we will be part of that design process. But the ultimate authority is still the parliament. Um, you know, we won't be able to usurp um, their decisions. However, we will have to be listened to because we're now, our voice is now enshrined in the constitution. A lot of us have sat on all kinds of committees trying to persuade, um, engage, educate, seduce, um, whoever we're talking to, mostly politicians, <laughs> to our point of view. But now they are, they are duty bound by their own law to properly hear us. Because fundamentally it just comes down to giving First Nations people the right to give advice on laws that affect them, isn't it? You guys will be able to say, this is what Parliament should do. It doesn't necessarily mean they will always do that. Unfortunately, that's the reality of our parliament. But I think that's an important thing. And, you know, mm. mentioning that that relationship, which that's what this will, will mm. look like. Mm. The voice will have the protection of the, the constitution given to it by the Australian people, by you. We mandated what we say will be mandated by the Australian public, the Australian people. And that's how it should be. That's our that's our democracy. That's our system. That's how it works. So um, there will be a big difference uh, in terms of how we are um, un understood and how we listen to, because you know, <laughs> it's a fundamental truism that when you engage the people that you're making laws and decisions about, you get better governance, you get better decision making, and you get, in our case, more targeted resources down to the areas where they are really needed. And this country is so much disadvantaged. We have so much money in this country. We have so much disadvantage and it's not getting down to us. It's as simple as that. So we have to get down to the areas of, of real need. And we understand our communities. We understand our families. So we will have better governance, I think, and better and better targeted allocation of the resources. The voice also won't be top down. It will be people living, you know, people will be elected, selected, whatever is decided by their own communities. Mm -hmm. The government's not, won't go around like it does now. We'll have you and you, not you, definitely not you, and so on and so forth. That's, that's finished. So people will be speaking for their own areas and their own communities, yet to be defined what those mm -hmm. areas might look like. But nevertheless, it will be people we will be electing people who are going to be our voice. Mm. So that's another thing. And I don't know whether the Australian public knows this, but we don't have access, a lot of our communities rather, don't have access to clean water, mm. um, which, which is a fundamental, basic human right. We don't have that in every area in Australia. It's actually that's a vast it. amount of area that doesn't. And even in my community of Menindee in the far west of New South Wales, it is one of our biggest issues and I've actually seen the benefit to the community by having both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal regional voices yeah. heard in the decision making when it comes to water policy and these things not just coming from Canberra. And I think that's why for me, I'll be voting yes, because I've seen what voices from the regions and voices from these areas, how they have better outcomes from people on the ground. The important thing here, because I'm from the Northern Territory, and we have so many issues and that just don't get dealt with. And we see the money that, you know, is allocated. In fact, the Productivity Commission has already said that this $30 billion comes to us every year. It's a lot of money. Mm. <laughs> Only about 20%, 27% rather, actually is gets to us and mm. to our needs. So the voice might say, well, where's the rest of the money? Where is it gone? Why do we have this ha shocking housing shortages across the country? Where is that money gone? Mm. Nobody asked that, so the voice would be asking once again for better governments and better decision making. And I think another thing it sort of comes down to as well is the fact that what we're doing right now isn't, isn't working. Is it? We are not seeing that closing of the gap, if you want to refer to that, or, you know, this life expectancy gap closing or those health outcomes changing or the opportunities for First Nations people. What we've been trying to do isn't working and it's about time that we try something new. There has to be change. Look, I think even people who um, probably don't even support the voice, I think everybody is agreed that 
there has to be change. The status quo hasn't worked. Despite the best efforts of all kinds of, pe all kinds of people over generations, it hasn't worked. The missing ingredient is you, you, we haven't been sitting at the table with you. Mm. People will say we have all these committees. Well, we do, but I've sat on them too, like a lot of you know, us out there. But there's no reason why they need to, and often they don't. Mm. So that's very nice. You get a pat on the head metaphorically mm. and you go back to home and that's it. But nothing changes, nothing really fundamentally changes. You know, we have to rely on, you know, a, a sympathetic uh, minister uh, that, and we have met them. <laughs> that's when we get some change, but it's really incremental. And now our societies are getting more and more complicated across the world mm. and it's time for change. I think everybody has agreed that there has to be a change and what is on the table is a perfectly reasonable guide to how we need to move forward and it will change everything. So Arnie Pat, my final question is, what would be your message to Australia? There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation around at the moment and we're not going to be able to get to cover it. So my message to you is when you go into the polling booth on that voting day, I think it was announced today, the 14th of October, when you're in the polling booth, there'll be just you and your conscience and you have to decide which way you're going to vote. There's only one way, yes or no. Whatever you vote, it's entirely up to you, of course, but I ask that you take responsibility where you put that, where, how you vote. Thank you. Well, Arnie Pat, you have been an absolute champion right from the beginning of this, <laughs> and I think it'll be a really tough couple months moving forward, but the work that you've put into this is amazing, and yeah. it's an honour to sit beside yeah. you. It's time, Australia, let's do it. Let's get this over and done with, and a successful uh, referendum. Authorised by E. Bennett, the Australia Institute, Canberra. Thanks for watching. If you like watching our videos or if you learn something new, let us know by leaving a like. And if you share this video on your social media or send it to a friend, that really helps us to get the message out. See you next time.